Mort Neff, the original Mr. Michigan Outdoors, pays us a visit this Thursday night as a judge in our second annual wild game cooking contest. What, be great. what are you spending your time doing now? You're, I happen to know, close to 80, give or take three or four years. Which side? <laughs> Join Mort Neff and myself, Fred Trost, for the second annual Michigan Outdoors wild game cooking contest this Thursday night right here on PBS. The following is a Michigan sesquicentennial year presentation. Michigan Outdoors is made possible in part by a grant from the Stroh Brewery Company, who also bring you Stroh's and Stroh Light, fire brewed for smoother taste. Seems and like you got most of the meat there. And then you peel it over. You turn around and you come, you take the rib bones out of it. Slicing like that? Mm-hmm. Okay, and you, so that's going to be in just a matter of a few seconds of boneless filet now. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot harder to do on a big fish, especially with people around, but I just take it halfway and then I come down the skin. Mm -hmm. Then I cut a hole in the skin so I can get a hold of it and I turn it around the other way. Well, that's a handy idea. And you actually pull on the skin as you put, cut with a knife. And that's, that's how it's done by the charter captains. Watch them do it for speed. Highlights of our 1982 fish filleting contest coming up. It's Thursday night, time for Michigan Outdoors. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fishery. It's an Arctic cold, the wind might whisper through the trees, listen if you can, it tells you of the beauty in this state of Michigan. In 1982, we held a fish filleting contest in Ludington among the charter captains. Now, I've always fancied myself as a good filleter. I get all the meat and I do it quickly. But I didn't know what quickly meant until we laid out the rules and started this contest. The time. If there's any rib bones on the fish, we're going to add three seconds to the time. Unless there's more than four rib bones, and then you're disqualified. Unless there's more than four inches of skin left on a fillet, and then you're disqualified. So we have to have some standards. Right, Ray? True. Now, does that sound fair enough? You guys yeah, can swing that? Sound, yeah. Okay. Now, we're going we're gonna to start out with the knife laying on the table. This is how this will work. Lay your, the knife will be laying on the table like this. You guys will determine when you want to start. And as soon as you touch the knife, Linda will start the stopwatch. Okay, so you go ahead and fillet. When you're done, if you want to go back and nip off a rib bone or take whatever time you want, when you set the knife back down on the board, that's when the clock will stop. That's the way the contest will be run. You guys all in accord with the rules? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, we're going to get started here. Why don't you all shake hands? I mean, shouldn't we do this? <laughs> shake hands and may the fastest man win, the better filleter win, and this is it. So let's get started on the contest. The fish were all weighed in beforehand, and these weights will be compared with the weights of the fillet, so the contestants are not only given credit for their speed, but the amount of meat on the fillet figures into their scores as well. The crowd was ready, the contestants were feeling the pressure, the cameras were rolling, so we got the contest underway. All of the fish have been weighed in, the first round of fish have been weighed in, and each, each filleter is going to do one fish at a time, round robin fashion, and we'll go through three fish. We don't know which is going to be the fastest win, Good luck. You volunteered to be first. Yeah. Okay, so as soon as you touch that knife, I start the clock, and as soon as you set it back down, I stop it. Okay, anytime you're ready. As the first contestant, Wynn was feeling the pressure, but they all did on their first fish. Their second and third tries were much better. So coming up are the highlights from the first annual Michigan Outdoors Fish Filleting Contest. Oh, he's smoking this one. Hey, he's got to pick up his own fillet, though. When it falls off the table, that could be a little loss of time. Oh, a little loss of time there. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Well, that's 23 seconds. Okay. 23 seconds. He's got a good grip on it as soon as he touches that knife. Okay, Jerry wears a glove on his left hand. 
Ooh, that was quick. Oh, having trouble with the backbone. You dig a little too deep, cut through that backbone, and then you're really in trouble. Here comes the, the skin. It looks like that's a skinless fillet. You can take the rib bones off. Jerry Lee has hit 25 seconds right now. Oops, trouble with the skin. Oh. There we go, 36 seconds. Go, Dave. Now he cuts the belly meat off all in one swoop like that, a little different than some of the other techniques. Oh, he's... How's he doing? Does he meet your approval? Yeah, he's doing good. You his coach? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> no. He he... Couldn't do it half as fast as any of these guys. Almost had him off there. Oh, he's doing a lot faster this time. All right, Dave, let's go. He's better on smaller sure fish. As soon as that knife, he sets it down. Good okay. job. Okay, 35 seconds. Hey, you made up for it. The crowd was, crowd was pulling for you. You did that in 35 seconds. Okay, Pete Rubianis, grab that knife and take off. <laughs> Got to get back when Pete fillets. He swings that knife around and the little pieces of fish and everything else are flying. Oh, he's, he's doing a heck of a job this time. Look at that, look at that. Ooh, this is going to be a good one. 15 seconds right now. Here comes the skin, 19 seconds. Okay, 22 seconds. <laughs> That's a, congratulations, Captain. No, I mean, well, I'll tell you what you do. Just rip that off, and I'll uh, take the meat with it. There we go. There he goes. He grabbed it. Cuts right down the belly. <laughs> How's he doing, Jerry? It's looking better. He's, he's a cool fish filet. I mean, he's calm, relaxed. Well, you bet. And, you know, those big fish are hard to handle. That's the biggest thing in flying is handling the fish. You know? mm -hmm. and that's the toughest thing. These little smaller fish are a little easier. But... Now, he goes over the rib bones right there. Now he's doing on the skinning. Now, the rest of you fellas uh, cut the rib bones off separately. There's a lot of method. It's about the method I used to use all the time, but you seem to get a little bit more meat when you do it and you take the ribs with it. Okay, that was 37 seconds. Very good. Okay, everybody, you wanna you wanna watch this? He's gonna be doing a second fish, the smaller one. Ed Stowe, grab his barrage of machinery here. Go ahead, Ed, anytime. Look at the way he does this. You would never think that using three pieces of equipment, two knives and pliers, but this man does a hundred tons of fish every year: white fish, lake trout, salmon. Look at the way he flipped that fillet over there. Oh. oh, no. 22 seconds. 22. Congratulations, Ed. 22. Boy, that was, that was about the prettiest job of fillet I've ever seen. Didn't that have... Wasn't that pretty to watch? <laughs> it sure was. I would just, if I had $100, I'd start uh, $5 on Ed, because I've it? seen him. <laughs> Boy, I'm telling you, he is the fastest knife in the West. We get a lot of questions about food and, uh, and the filleting contest. Are we going to have one of those again? Oh, I think we should. Looks like fun to me. I know, Bob. Bob thinks he's a better and faster <laughs> filleter than I am. Hey, hey, I'll challenge you. I'll challenge you, old we'll buddy. We'll see. They're, they're, hey, end of July, you and I. The grudge match. Uh -huh. uh -oh. Fishermania one or Fishermania <laughs> two. You know, we get a lot of questions on food, mm -hmm. I, about Bob especially, don't you? Yes. Number one is, does Bob Garner really eat all that food you prepare? Absolutely. I, I just love wild game and fish. I, 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 I love every bit of it. In fact, I wish we could have even some more exotic recipes like woodchuck and things like well, that. Well, you know those exotic it. recipes, people ask us about, can I substitute squirrel for rabbit? Can I substitute mm -hmm. venison for beef for oh, beef for venison? Absolutely. Most oh, certainly yeah. can. Chicken for pheasant, that That's sort of stuff. That's a good way yeah. to do it. It's all yeah. interchangeable. And when people complain and they say, I tried venison once and it was terrible, or I had a package of it and it was bad, <laughs> is it the recipe, Kath? No, it's not. It's not. The cooking, actually, it's pre before you get to the cooking part. It's, 
and preparation. You've got to trim it. That's A lot right. of questions about food. A popular subject in Michigan outdoors. We'll talk about it more. We'll be back right after this. Now, vision outdoors is extremely important. I thought I had the best protection, the best vision with the three pairs of glasses that I bought, these clear ones for everyday use, my shooting glasses and the Polaroids for the bright days. I found out that I'm much better off with these glasses I'm wearing right now. How so? Well, I'll give you the answer to that in just a minute. See if you can answer this question in our outdoor quiz. The first successful introduction of ringneck pheasants in the United States took place in Oregon in 1881. Did anyone try establishing pheasants earlier? George Washington released pheasants at Mount Vernon during his first term as president. The first presidential introduction was a flop. All of us who shoot, the older we get, we seem to have more problem focusing on that rear sight, the front sight, and the target. That's true. And uh, uh, around, as I said, around age 40, the eye starts losing its flexibility and focusing. and. Uh, you no longer have the fluid of movement of, that, of, that, of those muscles. And by the age of 50, really, you will not have the ability to see the rear sight and the front sight at the same time. You have to learn to compensate. Well, Doc, what can I do? <laughs> I, I want to keep shooting. Don't, don't get older. That's the only answer. Well, aren't there some things that you can prescribe or would contact lenses help? Or? No, well, contact lenses would, would maybe correct your vision for a distance, but that would still leave you with a problem at the intermediate and the near range. So. As I said, uh, if you're not using a scope, if you're using front and rear sights, then you're going to have some problems that you'll have to learn to compensate for with, but plenty of older hunters still do well. Well, Doc Russell gave me some kind of bad news, but I guess if everybody sooner or later is going to wear glasses, we might as well learn about it. It's a very important concept in outdoors forever, as a matter of fact. You know, the goal of Outdoors Forever is to protect and extend our physical abilities outdoors. That's for all of us, whether you're young or old, in a wheelchair or not. One of the main abilities that we need is our vision. We need to be able to see, we need to be able to be comfortable with our eyes outdoors and have them protected. I went by Dr. Avery Sterling. He owns Sterling Vision around Michigan, 20 different shops. He's a hunter, so is Tag O'Sullivan. They talked me into a pair of glasses that I swore I wouldn't be interested in. Well, let me see how these, these are a lot bigger than the ones I have. Yes, but you're wearing a frame way too small now. Hmm. Doesn't look, that, I could see how it has more protection. A lot more protection. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to cover your face for brush a lot better. It's a lot harder for brush to get up underneath your face mm -hmm. here. And this is what you want. Mm -hmm. And plus the sun coming in from all different angles. Mm hmm I found out from these two that wearing glasses really is something that every sportsman should do, whether they need a prescription or not. Uh, I used to think the only redeeming value of glasses was vision correction, visual acuity so I could see and focus whether those deer had antlers or not. But glasses also have the advantage of eye protection from twigs and dust outdoors. Then there's a new concern of ultraviolet ray protection to help prevent cataracts by getting coating on your lenses to filter out those harmful rays. And comfort, boy, that can extend your eyes outdoors by the wind, dust, and harsh sunlight. If you have corrective vision enhancement, that's another one. Vision enhancement can not only rest your eyes, but it can help you see as much as 15 minutes earlier in the morning and later in the evening with, well, something like a, a red tent like this or even the, the yellow type of shooting glasses. But what about all these glasses I've invested in? Three cases, three pairs of glasses, kind of a pain in the neck. These are the ones that they talked me into, and uh, I'm kind of amazed. Now, they're a designer frame. I thought, well, crying out loud, that's the last thing I need. But they said, look at this. These are Porsche frames. I suppose you pay something for the name. But with these frames, you can replace the lenses. Just flip this le le uh, little lever up on the front, put new lenses in. Right now, I'm putting in my uh, Polaroid sunglass lenses. Uh, I'm all set to go. Now, this, they're bigger. They protect me more. They have the ultraviolet protection. I th I'm going to be able to see better outdoors, see longer. Um, many advantages to it. Vision is an important part 
of our census outdoors. If you have questions on this, because I'm not an expert, call the number, the toll-free number at Sterling Vision, and they can answer your questions about ultraviolet, about the different lenses you can get, and, and some of the different frames and options, because our eyes outdoors are extremely important to all of us. We're going to talk more about this in our Outdoors Forever segments in the future. Right now, let's take a look at some of the upcoming events in our outdoor calendar. Learn how to train your retriever at a seminar in Northville. The seminar is March 21st, but call to pre-register by tomorrow, the 13th. Commemorative Bucks holds its first Michigan Deer Spectacular at the Exhibition Center in Lansing. Continuous seminars and displays of record bucks all weekend. You still have a couple of days to pre-register for the annual turkey hunting workshop at Michigan State, one of the many events taking place at Agriculture and Natural Resources Week on the MSU campus, March 24th through the 27th. Saturday, there's a fly fishing workshop in Okemos put on by the Red Cedar Fly Fishers, a fisherman swap meet and sports show both days this weekend in Defiance, Ohio, and the Leslie Blackhawk Bow Hunters have a 3D shoot this Sunday. The Four Square Sportsmen's Association is holding a turkey shoot in Jetto. The Raisin Valley Chapter of DU has their annual banquet next Thursday in Tecumseh, and the Grand Center Sport and RV Show starts in a week. Roger McCarvel and Catherine Mulhop will be there at the Outdoors Forever booth. Our annual Outdoors Club Fishing Workshop will be at the Okemos High School on April 4th. Seminars by many of the expert fishermen you've seen on Michigan Outdoors. And at the workshop, the first meeting for people who want to organize local Outdoors Forever chapters will be held. Come and find out how your club can become involved or how you can start a group in your area to promote the outdoors as a lifelong activity. This year's outdoor fair at Houghton Lake will be spectacular. If you enjoyed the retriever demonstrations and shooting show last year, this year will knock your socks off. The shooting show alone will be worth the drive to Houghton Lake. All kinds of bows, guns, and weapons will be demonstrated, and you'll find, the find out the fallacies of some of the fancy gun work on the TV shoot 'em ups The World Sanctioned Duck Calling Contest will be a big event and lots more, so don't miss our outdoor fair this June in Houghton Lake. If you missed a number, the Michigan Travel Bureau can give it to you. Just call 1-800-5432-YES. Wasn't the weather this past weekend great? It had a, an effect on the outdoors, mainly put the ice fishermen pretty much out of business throughout the state. Up in the UP, Dick's favorite sports in Keweenaw says, the ice is pretty much gone. They've been catching some coho and uh, steelhead at the falls, but rabbit hunting is good up there. They still have plenty of snow. The coyotes are active, and that is proving to be a problem for the deer. It always is at this time of year. Bayshore Resort at Gladstone, they have a foot of snow in the woods, two feet of ice on uh, Bay to knock, but it, the ice isn't really great at this time of year. Watch out for it. Perch and steelhead are moving into the bay. That fishing is picking up. At Hulbert, well, the recession here in winter has had a good effect on the deer. They're down to 60 coming in to feed right now, and this will just taper off in the next couple weeks to nothing. Harry's Place said they've been catching some large catches of husky perch on the north side of Manuskong Bay. Even though there's a foot and a half of ice out there in places, it's not safe for cars. It's bad ice. Real good perch fishing Sturgeon Bay, although Glenn's bait and tackle of Sheboygan says unsafe ice. They have been catching some good steelhead in the river, though, a 12-pounder this past week. Young's bait and tackle at Lanson says some good trout fishing around Harbor Springs, Petoskey, in that area. Alberta Sports Shop says off the piers. Right now, they were doing good a few days ago for browns and steelhead. Captain Emil Dean says there were more fishermen than fish this past weekend. Not a surprise with the weather. He caught six steelhead on Tuesday, by the way. Mick Fur Furbush from Muskegon says the turkeys are gobbling all around. Baldwin looks like a good turkey season coming up. Brown trout off the coast here in southwestern lower Michigan, according to Best Chance Sporting Goods. Over here at Wellman Sports Center on the Oscoda, the steelhead are still in good shape at the lower part of the Osable River, but the ice is gone, at least fishing Tawas Bay in this area. It's pretty much blown out of the way. And Houghton Lake, well, uh, Dick Peterson says they've been catching some crappie on the East Bay. Ron Reed says good catches of bluegill off the South Shore and the middle grounds. No cars, though. That ice is really rotten as you're auguring holes. Harlow's on the bay. Joe Harlow says that we have some 20-foot ice piles because of the wind blowing the ice, stacking it up along the shore so the fishermen can't get out. Their perch are hitting well in the cuts, but you got to watch the ice if you can find it in the ditches. They're, they're fishing from shore. Ice flows jamming up the St. Clair River, but Brown Bear Sporting Goods says 
fawns. They said they've had some fawns reported already. Well, it could be. It's just the start of it. Looks like we have hopefully a good weekend coming up in the outdoors. Watch out for that ice. And above all, get to your telephones, call your PBS station, call in a pledge. We need it for hunting and fishing on television. See you next week. Michigan Outdoors is made possible in part by a grant from the Stroh Brewery Company, who also bring you Stroh's and Stroh Light, fire brewed for smoother taste.